presents us and is involved in nearly everything we do, we often take it for granted. For example, language is invisible unless we write it down. And spoken language is ephemeral unless we videotape or audio tape what we say and do with language. And yet the ways we use language in schools is critical to shaping how and what people learn. At all levels of schooling, the ways we use language and the ways we treat different groups of language users are potential bridges or barriers to full access to content knowledge and to the development of bilingualism and biliteracy. Professor Rosa's lecture tonight is an opportunity to reflect on how we are regarding language in our educational as well as out-of-school lives. Tonight's lecture can help us think about what it means to study, teach, research, and work here in this Hispanic-serving institution that is Texas State University. As many of you know, Texas State holds that federal designation, an HSI, or Hispanic-serving institution, primarily because our student population is 37% Hispanic or Latinx. Our student population is also 11% African American and 5% other non-white groups. So we are more diverse in terms of ethnicity than some Hispanic serving institutions and other minority serving institutions. With this ethnic and racial diversity comes diversity in language, and we are fortunate at Texas State to have students, staff, and faculty who speak, write, and sign multiple varieties of English, Spanish, Spanglish, as well as many, many other languages. The success of our mission here depends on helping all of our students, and especially our future and current educators, to see linguistic diversity as a resource for every person's learning. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Jonathan Rosa, is eminently qualified to help us think about the identities of Latinx and other linguistically and culturally diverse learners. His research can inform our efforts to recognize and honor this diversity in our common work. His ideas about language and race can help us rethink our schools, our classrooms, and curriculum to better meet the educational strengths, assets, and needs of our students and of each other, our colleagues. Dr. Rosa is one of the leading scholars in the United States on racial linguistics and Latinx youth identity formation. He holds a BA in linguistics and educational studies from Swarthmore College, master's and doctoral degrees in sociocultural and linguistic anthropology from the University of Chicago. He has worked as a postdoctoral fellow and assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Northwestern University, and New York University. Since 2015, Dr. Rosa has been on the faculty at Stanford University, where he holds the position of associate professor and teaches in the Graduate School of Education and the Center for Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity, and also by courtesy in the Departments of Linguistics and Anthropology. Among Dr. Rosa's many publications and scholarly accomplishments, I want to highlight his recently published work, Looking Like a Language, Sounding Like a Race, Ratio-Linguistic Ideologies and the Learning of Latinidad. This is published with Oxford University Press, 2019. With College of Education colleagues, as I've said, we've been preparing for tonight through the reading of the book and thinking through with Dr. Rosa's ideas and each other's ideas. This is an incredibly accomplished scholarly record, and this is an incredibly thoughtful and well-nuanced work that brings ethnography and, and theorizing together to help us understand and change our world. We're grateful, and we welcome you forward to hear your presentation. Thank you, and welcome. So can you all hear me? Is my microphone on? It's wonderful to have the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Thank you, Dean O'Malley, for that introduction. Thank you also to Luke for your introduction. Um, I am visiting Texas State and San Marcos for the first time, so I have been uh, treated to a great deal of hospitality, and I'm grateful for your willingness to share your time this evening. So my presentation is based on a range of work in which I've been participating and engaging for some time now, focused on questions surrounding race, inequality, language, and education. Often in my presentations, I open with an image like this cartoon, which I think speaks to some 
prevailing assumptions about the nature of the relationship between language and identity, especially in educational <coughs> So here in the cartoon, you sort of see this claim that ideas about language are not about identity, they're just about correctness, and correctness is an objective fact about language. It doesn't have anything to do with race, or class, or gender, or other kinds of categories of difference. There's also the way in which this image pictures sort of a racialized and gendered image of an imagined teacher, which is not entirely unrepresentative of the US teaching force, which is predominated by white women, even in situations where students of color predominate uh, in student bodies uh, in cities and in communities throughout the nation. So we want to think about how these demographics sort of play out, how they shape learning experiences. But this claim that language is somehow separate from identity is a fascinating sort of suggestion especially in a post-civil rights moment in the United States where it's no longer publicly acceptable in most mainstream settings to suggest that populations are biologically inferior based on ideas about race. So historically, anthropologists and other researchers have engaged in a range of troublesome sorts of projects where they measure skull shapes and brain sizes and this kind of thing to make these sorts of claims about biological inferiority. That's no longer acceptable. But we do hear claims about populations suffering from so-called culture of poverty, or we hear the suggestion that populations lack academic language, or correct language, or legitimate language, this kind of thing. So part of what I'm interested in focusing on most specifically is the way in which ideas about language are profound sites for the reproduction of stigmatizing ideas about race, gender, class, and other sorts of axes of difference. So how has race been remapped from biology onto language and culture? We want to pay very close attention to these sorts of stereotypes about language and culture and the ways that they reproduce these ideas about race, class, gender, and other sorts of categories. So as a, a sort of representation of a countervailing viewpoint, we might think with Gloria Saldua, who famously said, ethnic identity, if you really want to hurt me, talk badly about my language, ethnic identity is twin skin to linguistic identity. I am my language. So Ansal Lua rejects this notion that language and identity are separate from one another in any way. Famously in her sort of um, Chicana lesbian feminist thinking and her broader philosophical project has sought to point to spaces beyond these sorts of rigid boundaries between language and between identity. And to think about how the maintenance of those boundaries, again in relation to race, class, gender, sexuality, and language, have had deleterious effects, really troublesome impacts on communities and students um, throughout the nation and throughout the world. We might also think with a whole range of other thinkers, or a whole range of other sort of philosophers, researchers, community members, who've been pushing back to challenge us to reconsider the nature of these ideas about language. So Tony Morrison, for example, things he said more than 40 years ago, and this quotation is a little bit quiet, so I'll see if you can hear it, you can read it just in case. trying to prove that your language is just as good as trying to prove that a stigmatized or marginalized population based on race, especially in terms of this analysis, that uh, uh, racialized populations are capable of governance, are capable of art, are capable of language, any of these realms of, of life across different sorts of spaces. The suggestion that if we could just prove that marginalized or racialized populations are as good as a, a presumed norm, then that would somehow address the fundamental problem. But Tony Morrison argues that that's not the nature of the problem, that's a distraction. And continually trying to prove that your practices, language, and otherwise are just as good as expected norms or dominant norms, mainstream norms, is in many ways, she argues, sort of a false theory of change. And she suggests that we could be up to something else if we ceased trying to focus so much of our attention on demonstrating that marginalized or stigmatized populations are as good as. She says none of that is necessary, there will always be one more thing. So as soon as you prove that your language practices are as good as an imagined norm in one way, the bar can shift, and then there will be one more thing. 
And so the question on some level is what else could we be up to if our approaches in education weren't simply focused on trying to get marginalized populations to meet an imagined norm? And in fact, in what ways has our analysis of the nature of inequality in relation to education and other kinds of institutional realms taken for granted what language is, what learning is, what achievement is, what skills are, this kind of thing. And how has language been turned into a particular kind of problem, a problem that is deeply misleading in educational spaces. So in order to make sense of this production of language as a problem, try to look at a particular kind of historical uh, dynamics. And Morrison, I think, is also pushing us to reconsider the, the relationship across uh, uh, different modes of stigmatization throughout history. And so I'm particularly interested in colonial histories especially, and the way the histories of colonialism in the United States and elsewhere have produced particular, positioned particular populations as problems, and positioned particular aspects of population practices as problems. And so we might think, borrowing from the, the Caribbean philosopher, or Martinican philosopher, Aimé Césaire, who claimed again more than 60, or sorry, more than, uh, um, at this point, 60 years ago, uh, my turn to state an equation, colonization equals stigmatization. So Césaire is thinking about the ways that colonialism has informed histories of colonialism, that is the domination of land, labor, and resources, has shaped the ways that we make sense of um, the, the modern world. Shapes the way that we take for granted what borders are, borders that stipulate differences between populations and territories. A whole range of aspects of the modern world have been turned into things in a particular way through colonialism. So I'm interested in building off of Cesar's thinking to try to understand how race and equality language and education have been colonially thingified, have been made into particular kinds of problems in mainstream institutions. So in order to illustrate what I'm getting at here, let's look at ways that uh, language and race have been framed as a problem of some sort. So often when I give these kinds of presentations, I have to find an example of something racist that someone said in the news recently. And usually you don't have to look too far. It turns out Tom Brokaw gave us this wonderful comment just a couple of weeks ago on the weekend news show Meet the Press when he had this to say. <laughs> Objective fact. 
So you can become American in straightforward ways if you choose to be American. This is sort of the prevailing assumption about assimilation. But I would want us to think really carefully about what gets constructed as American and what gets erased from the history of the Americas. So we might want to ask ourselves, what's the relationship between the United States and the Americas? And how is it that America has been defined in relation to the United States exclusively? But this notion or these questions about assimilation that Rokha is speaking to, uh, he positions language as the most straightforward sign, and trajectories of language learning as the most straightforward signs for making sense of the extent to which someone has become American or populations have become American. And I want to, uh, again, think really critically about the ways that these assumptions about Americanness and the English language or English language learning erase indigenous languages in the United States, erase the Spanish language in the United States, whose presence predated the English language through its own colonial history vis a vis indigenous populations. So, this notion that Americanness is the English language is an interesting sort of claim and involves a whole range of historical erasures. So these ideas about population shifts, the future of the United States, trajectories of assimilation are invoked across a range of popular cultural formats. You see lots of media headlines like these, which tie together stereotypes about identity and futures and language. So the notion that the US future hinges on the Hispanic population, this question of the rate at which this population will increase, um, the role of the English language in constituting uh, Latino identity in the future. And perhaps my favorite one, the US will be the biggest Spanish speaking country by 2050, just says scholar somewhere. Um, <laughs> you don't need any actual evidence to support this kind of a claim. Just say it. Uh, so, this idea that the English is the language of the American future, or that Spanish is the language of the American future, and how to make sense of this, and this investment in trying to track very carefully what the nation is becoming. The positioning of language is the clearest sign of that process. So in some situations, Spanish is promoted as the language of the future. Some of you might recall the summer 2012 blockbuster film Elysium starring Matt Damon, which pictures a sort of figurative 22nd century post-apocalyptic Los Angeles, where the destitute masses are stuck in Los Angeles and the wealthy people have escaped Earth to live in a space station in the sky. It's sort of like a luxury resort. And in the space station in the sky slash luxury resort, they speak standardized varieties of English and French. And the people who are stuck on planet Earth in Los Angeles, working in the context of nuclear fallout, speak Spanglish, including Matt Damon. And so in the media rollout that coincided with the release of the film, another one of its stars, Diego Luna, had this to say in an interview with Conan O'Brien. Okay, so this is in the picture that prophesizes in this movie that everybody speaks Spanish. Well, yeah, because that's sort of the way it's gone. Why? 
It's better for the air. And we spend less because it runs on gas and electrical power. Even in the heat, it uses both. Why do we use the See? So why do you worry, Lord? For the future. The Omni 2007 also a hybrid synergy drive the power in your phone. So it's just a creepy commercial in general. <laughs> <laughs> the father's sort of backward look at the child will make you cringe for life. I think it's an awkward way, but there's something interesting here. So the father's bilingualism is analogized to a hybrid fuel technology. So the father's English and Spanish is just like the car in some sense. The sun is an embodiment of an imagined future. The sun is figured here as English dominant, and that's made anal analogous to a fully renewable fuel future. So we're not there yet, we're only hybrid. A fully renewable fuel is like being English dominant or English monolingual, which then presumes that the previous generation, or the, ling the, the linguistic gas guzzler, would be someone who is Spanish dominant or Spanish monolingual. So these ideas about the Spanish and English languages in relation to an imagined past a presence of hybridity and a future of English monolingualism is fascinating to track here. So we might in a, um, a, a, a track the ways that these sorts of stereotypes about English as the future are articulated in a range of institutional contexts, often in relation to ideas about education. So famously, of course, Newt Gingrich, when he was seeking the Republican nomination for the presidency in the run-up to the 2008 election, had this to say about bilingual ed. We should replace bilingual education with immersions, with immersion in English, so people learn the common language of the country, and so they learn the language of prosperity, not the language of living together. So Gingrich intertwined these stereotypes about neighborhoods, about class, socioeconomic class, class trajectories, especially language learning and race in, in lots of ways. Um, that again frame uh, language learning and English language learning as a straightforward pathway towards so upward socioeconomic mobility. But again, this flies in the face of the experiences of millions of people throughout the United States, especially racialized people, populations who might identify as monolingual English users and yet still face profound experiences of institutional exclusion across contexts. So people for whom English might be their primary language or the only language that they use comfortably and yet are facing educational exclusion, exclusion from stable housing and employment, healthy food, healthcare in general. So the English language doesn't magically solve all of these problems because it turns out that our political economy is not linguistic in nature. So simply acquiring more language doesn't make jobs rain down from the sky in uh, living wage, uh, corresponding to them, or any of these broader sort of structural transformations. So we want to think about the sort of narrative that Gingrich is fitting here. But there's also the way in which the knee-jerk reaction, I think progressive reaction to someone like Gingrich, is to sort of say, no, we should champion bilingualism and we should champion bilingual education. Which on one level, that makes perfect sense. But I want us to be really careful about the particular ways that we articulate our case for bilingualism and bilingual education. Much less it ends up looking something like this. So you have an advertisement for Spanish language learning on the left and English language learning on the right. So on the left, a lighter skinned man is positioned as a boss here of some sort. He's wearing a shirt and tie that says, can't speak Spanish and need his book. On the right, you have a darker skinned man dressed less formally, presumably a laborer of some sort. It says, no habla inglés, no speak English, necesitas de libro, you need this book. And so to be clear, both of these advertisements, both sides, are promoting bilingualism and promoting language learning, but it's bilingualism in service of, the, of a reproduction of a class hierarchy. So learning Spanish is good for a boss to re remain in a superior position, and learning English is good for a, a, a laborer to remain in a subordinate position. And I want us to be very careful about how we advocate for bilingualism, much less we forget that it could work in service of reproducing a whole range of hierarchies that we are precisely what we want to challenge, I think, in our advocacy for a whole range of language learning opportunities. So this advertisement also speaks to the dynamic of looking like a language, sounding like a race, which has informed my thinking for some time, whereby race is perceived as linguistically audible and language is made racially intelligible in particular ways, so that we presume that we can hear someone's race through their language or vice versa. Um, so these sorts of interrelations among race and language are central to my thinking, and again, across a range of contexts, whereby we see how 
ideas about race can transform a perception of language and vice versa. And just to show you one example of this, this is a clip from a recent um, television award show in which the actresses uh, Eva Longoria and uh, America Ferreira had this to say to each other. Yes, hi, I'm Eva Longoria, not Eva Mendes. And hi, I'm America Ferreira, not Tina Rodriguez. this idea that Latinas are uh, uh, interchangeable with one another based on stereotypes about race and gender especially. So MTV Australia tweets this out in response to that sort of display. They say, where are the English subtitles? Have no idea what they're saying. And so this is intended as a joke on some level, but what's interesting to me is the logic that informs the joke. So how is it that when particular people are producing what might be perceived from a range of perspectives as monolingual English use or as unaccented English use, and this is all in scare quotes, um, how is it that someone could ask for subtitles in relation to that? So how is it that based on race, their English language use is rendered unintelligible? And this is what looking like a language and sounding like a race sort of, this is how that plays out in everyday context. Um, often in educational spaces where um, students are positioned in highly precarious ways in relation to particular labels that uh, assume their deficiency. So all of these sorts of dynamics between popular discourses uh, surrounding race, language, and trajectories of language learning have informed my work on the ground in a range of communities, particularly the work that shaped the, my writing of this book, Looking Like a Language, Sounding Like a Race, which is a study of a Chicago public high school and its surrounding communities. Um, it's a high school uh, in which uh, of the 1,000, roughly 1,000 students, more than 95% of them are Mexican or Puerto Rican. About 4.5% of the students are African American. And uh, allegedly, there was one white student in the school who no one could find for me. Um, who I wanted to be desperately to learn about their experiences. But this reflects the profound patterns of segregation that shape students' um, everyday lives within the city of Chicago. So kids of color in Chicago often do not know a white peer by name. Whiteness is embodied in teachers, in administrators, in police officers, and in popular cultural figures. So this is sort of central to how students are experiencing uh, shared positions with, uh, in relation to spatial, racial, and class exclusion in the city of Chicago. So when I first met with the principal of this high school, who was a brilliant Puerto Rican woman, she said to me, Look, I want to give it to you straight. She said, when people look at my students, they see them through stereotypes. They see them as gangbangers or hoes. So gangbangers or whores. She said, I want them to be seen as young Latino professionals. I was really struck by this when she said this. First of all, I said, I just met you and you said ho oh, to me, so that was a lot of me. Stereotypes about gender, race, and sexuality, so we'll deal with that. And then this claim that you want your students to be seen as young Latino professionals. And I was curious about the ways that this positions the problem uh, within the students themselves. So who needs to change? Do the students need to undergo a change? Or do we need to transform people's perceptions of students? Or is it both simultaneously? So is it that we need to change how the students are being recognized or how the students are presenting themselves? Um, and what is this, what are these figures? What is this figure of a young Latino professional? In what ways is that a, is that a troublesome sort of um, figure that uh, is an assimilationist kind of model or what's going on there with this notion of a young Latino professional? And so much of my work um, in this school and in surrounding communities involved trying to track the creation of this image of a young Latino professional and trying to figure out how that figure corresponded to stereotypes about borders that separate, on the one hand, sorry, which is just an image of the school. But I'm interested in the ways that this notion of a young Latino professional involved the creation and negotiation of borders that separate ethno-racial, linguistic, and geopolitical sorts of territories. So, the ways that the, the maintenance of boundaries, or the transgression of boundaries surrounding language, surrounding nationality, and surrounding race and ethnicity is happening in relation to this creation of young Latino professionals. So part of what was interesting to me about that idea of young Latino professional is how it stood in stark contrast to the students' identification of themselves, first and foremost, as Mexican or Puerto Rican in this school. And it's like images in the top left and the bottom right, you see uh, popular displays of Mexican pride surrounding neighborhoods. So
Anthony of Chicago, in the top right and bottom left, you see popular displays of Puerto Rican pride. So each school year is bookended by a celebration of Mexican independence in September, and then the Puerto Rican parade and festival in June. So you go in the school year Mexican, and you go out Puerto Rican. And it's a big deal for all of the students in the school who are deeply invested in their various identities. And you might see a grad school me in the Puerto Rican parade in the bottom left. I would talk about, but that's another conversation. So the students were trying to make sense of where they were positioned in relation to this category of Latino, uh, particularly in terms of their identification first and foremost as Mexican or Puerto Rican. So this is an interview with two boys who are both Puerto Rican, um, who are juniors within the school, and I'll play the clip in a second. But the equal sign signal interruptions and the brackets are overlapping speech. Here's what they have to say. And Puerto Rican and Mexican flag, 
And this is a church where an undocumented Mexican woman, Elvira Arellano, took sanctuary for more than a year in 2007. And the Puerto Rican parade was dedicated to this undocumented Mexican woman in 2008. This would be unthinkable virtually anywhere else in the United States. The idea that the Puerto Rican parade was going to be dedicated to a Mexican woman and an undocumented Mexican woman at that would be virtually unthinkable. But in Chicago, that makes perfect sense based on the kind of pan-ethnic sorts of relationships that have been constructed there over time. So the students are reworking these categories of race and ethnicity. They're constructing complex pan-ethnic identities and really transforming and challenging our ideas about race and ethnicity. But they're not just invested in their Puerto Ricanness and Mexicanness in general, but in their Chicago-based Puerto Ricanness and Mexicanness. So this is an image of a Nike Air Force One shoe that one student had. You see it has a Mexican flag, but also in the green part toward the back of the shoe, it has the Chicago skyline. So you see the Sears Tower and other sorts of buildings there. So it's not just about asserting a Mexican identity, but a Chicago Mexican identity or a diasporic identity that reflects the students' um, sorts of ideas about the ways that national borders don't quite make sense to them. So Mexico exists in Chicago for these students. Another student had this tattoo, which is a map of the state of Illinois with a Mexican flag, and then it shouts out Little Village, which is a predominantly Mexican neighborhood in Chicago. So here, Illinois is claimed as the state of Mexico, and then the neighborhood in Chicago is laminated on top of that. So Mexico exists in Chicago for these students. Similarly, you have giant monuments to the Puerto Rican flag in the city of Chicago. These are the largest monuments to any flag in the world, and people say, what is wrong with Puerto Ricans and flags? What's the nature of that obsession? We've got to remember that the US colonial government outlawed public display of the Puerto Rican flag from 1898 to 1952. So in many ways, display of the Puerto Rican flag for some Puerto Ricans is a sign of anti-colonial pride in this context. Um, these flags bound a strip of streets. There are two of them. Um, they bound a strip of streets known as Paseo Boricua, or Puerto Rican promenade. The flags stretch 59 feet in the air and 56 feet across, and they're made of steel, they're welded, and they're piped because those are the three primary industries in which Puerto Ricans participated as they migrated to the city of Chicago and helped build the city. So Puerto Ricanness and Chicagoness are laminated together, much like Mexicanness and Chicagoness are laminated together for folks in these areas. And you see the light blue of this Puerto Rican flag, which is again a sign of sort of a, a independentista or sort of a radical anti-colonial perspective for some Puerto Ricans, as opposed to the blue of a normative Puerto Rican flag, which corresponds to the blue of the US flag. So students were invested in this Chicago Puerto Rican flag as well. One student had uh, this flag tat tattooed on his chest with the Chicago skyline. The top is a beautiful Spanglish tattoo by the Spanish dominant tattoo artist who translated city, uh, Windy City using into Spanish, which would be Ciudad de Viento, and then back into English, which is City of Wind. So it's Spanish syntax, English words or lexical items, so a beautiful kind of Spanglish thing happening there. And at the bottom it says, Yo soy de aquí, I'm from here. And the question is whether here is Chicago, is here Puerto Rico, or is Puerto Rico in Chicago? Um, you can't just be a Chicago Bulls fan, you have to be a Mexican or a Puerto Rican Bulls fan or a Bulls in this community. And it shows the way that the students are deeply invested in rethinking national identities. And for them, they're experiencing multiple national identities simultaneously. Um, perhaps most interestingly for me, you have a flag like this one, which is known as 79th. This is dedicated to that neighborhood, Paseo Boricua, or Humboldt Park, between the giant steel flags. Uh, and it figures, it, it, it represents sort of a colonial imagery, invoking Africanness, indigeneity, and Europeanness, invoking Puerto Rico, and invoking Chicago. The flag is named 79th because there are 78 municipalities, official municipalities, on the island of Puerto Rico. And this neighborhood in Chicago has been designated as the 79th municipality of Puerto Rico. Um, so the sense is that Puerto Rico exists in Chicago, much like Mexico exists in Chicago, and vice versa for many folks in these neighborhoods. So they're reworking borders that separate ethnic and racial identities, they're reworking borders that separate geographical and political sorts of territories, and they're also reworking borders that separate languages. In some situations, they double down on those borders, and other situations, they call them into question. So on one level, the students are deeply invested in signaling their capacity to produce what's perceived as unaccented English. This is an interview with a young man um, who you heard in one of the earlier clips who's Puerto Rican, and he has this to say about the English language. Whoa! You came real hard with me, why are you sound nice to me? I'm just talking to you. 
So he's referencing playing sort of an internet-based video game console where his virtual opponents can hear his voice but not see his face. And he's grappling with the way in which his English language use is perceived as Mexican. And he's trying to figure out if he was just speaking English based on his stereotype, Mexican is associated with the Spanish language. So why would someone presume that he's Mexican if he's speaking English? But he's coming to terms with the racialization of the English language and the ways in which that racialization is based on a set of assumptions about Latinidad that aligns Latinidad with Mexicanness in particular. And so he can be recognized as Mexican or perceived as Mexican even when speaking English. But the clip also reflects the ways that he's invested in, he develops a kind of anxiety surrounding his English language use and whether his English language use is accented, which reflects an investment in signaling the capacity to produce what's perceived as unaccented English. So on one level, they're invested in the English language and sort of imagine unaccented English. On another level, they're invested in Spanish, but not just Spanish in general, particular varieties. This is a young woman who's a sophomore in the school. She's from Mexico City. She came to Chicago at the age of 10. Hey, where are you going to be the best Spanish? The best Spanish? Yeah. I thought that it was going to be um, the Spain, yeah. but I heard that it's not. It's in Mexico. Okay. Do you want to go to Puerto Rico? Do you want to go to Puerto Rico? No. No. No, because they don't get the. They don't say the words right. They miss it so much. Like, like they, they, sometimes they do the R, sometimes they do the N, and it's like really weird. Okay. And with Mexicans, I was so Mexican, they don't have talk. And this is much less you think it's only Puerto Ricans who invoke stigmatizing stereotypes about Mexicans. It goes in both directions in Chicago. And there's the play from some uh, Chicago-based Mexicans that Puerto Ricans are so hungry that they eat all the ends off of all, or they eat all of the S's off the ends of their words. Um, one Mexican student asked me whether they can have the news in Puerto Rico. And I said, of course. And she said, they let people talk like that on TV, though. Um, and she was sort of grappling with the way that there are multiple varieties of more Puerto Rican Spanish. Some varieties which are imagined as more standardized, and some varieties that are imagined as non-standardized. And so um, this investment in Mexican Spanish as correct is fascinating. And she also is invoking sort of a, a shift in the varieties of Spanish that have been used in mainstream US schools from Iberian or Castilian Spanish to uh, Mexico City Spanish. So there's an investment in Mexican Spanish in particular. Other students were invested in Puerto Rican Spanish. This boy is Mexican Rican, so his birth mother is Mexican, his birth father is Puerto Rican, um, and he was uh, largely raised by a Puerto Rican foster family, and he's deeply invested in Puerto Ricanness and Puerto Rican Spanish. Do you think that Mexican Spanish or Puerto Rican Spanish is better? Puerto Rican Spanish. Why? Because that's what's up, huh? <laughs> I mean, what's smarter? Smarter? Puerto Rican Spanish. Okay. They're very smart. Okay, I think Mexican Spanish is smart too far. What's more correct? What's more correct? I think Mexican. Okay. Because they like, almost say it sounds. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, the same thing. Mm-hmm. 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 Bear with them and don't standardize the music. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so, can you do an impression of a Puerto Rican and Mexican saying something? Like, a Mexican would have bought all of them and said it, they sound. And a Puerto Rican would have bought all of them and said it, they sound. Like that, you know? Okay. Like that. Okay. Look, hands on the ground, I'm going to put this in the background. I'm going to put this in the background. What does that mean to have it in the They have it in the background. What does that mean? I think they don't. They don't think about me in Spanish. Think, bro. What does that mean, bro? Like, like all the other languages in Spanish, the other languages, they don't think about it. 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 Shaped his 
perception of some of these mental categories. The other students did much better impersonations of one another. He also, I put him on the spot, and he's trying to produce standardized Spanish forms and produces what are largely perceived as non-standardized forms or incorrect forms, this kind of thing. Um, but he's invested in the coolness of Puerto Rican Spanish, the flow of Puerto Rican Spanish, and he and, and various students constructed this imaginary in which Puerto Rican Spanish was cool and incorrect, and Mexican Spanish is correct and uncool. And this reflects a mirror remapping of stereotypical constructions of what's imagined as white and black English. So white English stereotypically is constructed as correct and uncool, and black English is stereotypically constructed as cool and incorrect, aligning blackness and Puerto Ricanness and Mexicanness and whiteness in this particular setting. Note that Mexican Spanish is not often corrected, uh, constructed as correct throughout the United States. So in this particular kind of dynamic, Puerto Ricanness and Mexicanness were being imagined in these sort of complex ways. But the students were invested in signaling their intimate knowledge of the Spanish language while also signaling their investment of the capacity to produce what's perceived as unaccented English. So how do you speak Spanish in English without being perceived as possessing an accent? The students do this, they manage these competing demands by engaging in practices I call inverted Spanglish. So you heard here when he says like you hear from reggaeton music, he trills his R really hard on reggaeton. I want you to hear how he pronounces his R in barreras here. And so does your program teach that? Yeah. What kind of Spanish you learn your Spanish? Like you just learned it from Ines Ferreira. I said it's a real references an English language learning platform often advertised in Spanish language media, including Barreras. You know he can trill his R in Barreras because of how he pronounces reggaeton, but he says here, Iglesias Barreras. But no, he signals his intimate knowledge of Spanish language media through referencing this language learning platform, while also engaging in these sort of hyper-English or anglicized pronunciation patterns, Iglesias Barreras. So we signal these multiple kinds of affiliations simultaneously based on the ways that the English and Spanish languages are not entirely separate for him, um, and in ways that they're not entirely separate for many of these students. So English and Spanish live within one another, just like Mexico and Puerto Rico live within Chicago, and just like Puerto Ricanness and Mexicanness live within one another and within Americanness. Um, students engage in other forms of inverted Spanglish, sometimes through literacy practices, like a group of Mexican um, ninth grade students who would play a joke on only their most beloved monolingual English speaking white teachers, um, who they would then let in on the joke after they played the joke, where they would say, teacher, I don't know how to pronounce these words, can you help me? Um, and you can help with this. And the teacher would say, sure, that's no problem. It's cheese cheese, ringos, culeros. So the teacher is inadvertently saying, pinches, ringos, culeros, or something white, or American apple. And the students would laugh hysterically after the teacher would say this. And then let, I, I mentioned that it's only their most beloved teachers who they would then let in on the joke and then engage often in impromptu kind of language learning lessons with one another. And no, again, in a hyper-segregated context where whiteness is embodied in authority, the students are grappling with a complex set of racial dynamics, and this is a, quite a constructive way in which to do so, where they let the teacher in on it, and then they learn together. Um, so for the students, what looked like English language written forms, the Spanish language lives within those forms because the English and Spanish languages are not separate for these students in any straightforward way. And so this reworking of borders around languages, around identities, ethnic and racial and national and geopolitical sorts of borders, reflects sort of an imagination of a, a possible world that I think is exciting to learn from and with in this context. But part of the work for me is never just sort of advocating for language learning as an end in itself, but rather connecting these struggles over language to broader sort of rights struggles and justice struggles. So the other book that came out last month is uh, of mine. Uh, it was a, a volume that I worked on with a, a whole range of colleagues that looks at some of these struggles around language and social justice and this reworking of borders. And in my concluding um, few minutes, I just want to point to one case on the ground where I've worked with communities not to just document their practices of reimagining borders, but to try to work with these communities to rethink what schools could look like and what learning could look like based on these insights um, surrounding language and identity. So I was working in a predominantly Puerto Rican neighborhood in western Massachusetts, known as Holyoke, Massachusetts. It has the highest concentration of Puerto Ricans anywhere outside of the island of Puerto Rico. So it's a city that's roughly half Puerto Rican, 
its student body in K-12 schools is 80% Puerto Rican. What's interesting is that these high percentages of Puerto Ricans are often associated with high rates of educational underachievement. So here's polio, which has the highest percentage of students by far in the state of Massachusetts who are soaring below proficient on a statewide assessment. So often, Puerto Ricanness is constructed and imagined in relation to educational underachievement, and that's also associated often with language difference. So this is a headline and sort of the opening of a news story about Puerto Rican rates of, achieve, of educational achievement in Holyoke. It says Holyoke, again, is among the lowest in the state despite a high school graduation rate that improved slightly to 53.8% from the previous year's 52.8%. The city of 40,000 is roughly half Hispanic. Among challenges, officials have said, is that English is not the first language for more than 70% of public school students. Uh, so here, the problem in terms of educational achievement within Holyoke is framed in relation to language. So the Spanish language is the explanation for these educational underachievement rates. It's not high, it's tremendous sorts of histories of endemic um, structural inequality. It's not the ways that resources have been allocated or dispossessed from people within these communities. It's not lack of access to stable housing or living wage. That, none of that is framed as the problem. It's language by itself. And language is also framed as the quick fix. So if these people would just learn English, then everything would work out. So again, I want to think about how language is framed as the solution to these challenges. Um, Holyoke residents understand and receive and speak back to the stigmatization of the Spanish language. As one poet put it in the community, this city is allergic to Spanish. But it turns out, in fact, that the city is not allergic to Spanish because the young, charismatic, white, queer mayor of Holyoke, Alex Morse, is bilingual. And he speaks English and Spanish. He learned his Spanish in the Dominican Republic in a study abroad here, that kind of thing. And his Spanish is celebrated and framed as one of his wonderful assets that makes him a stronger leader within the community. The question is, why is the Spanish language so valuable for particular populations, but framed as a disability for other populations? And so how do these sort of disparate dynamics play out? In order to respond to all of this, I work with a Holyoke High School teacher and a group of Holyoke High School students, bringing together some of my university students to engage in a range of language learning and um, research projects where we study language use across the community, interviewing students' families, studying vernacular language use in signage and in slang, this kind of thing. We study policy sorts of patterns in terms of the anti-bilingual education um, ordinance that was enacted throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the turn of the century. And then some students were engaging in ethnographic studies of language use in barbershops and churches and various commercial spaces. So I'll just show you a couple of examples from this research and then wrap up. On um, the students who were engaging in the oral history interviews with their families found um, really interesting things. So this is a freshman who's very boisterous, so prepare yourself, who's interviewing his mother. And all of the interviews came back asymmetrically bilingual, like this one where the students were speaking English and the parents spoke Spanish. Um, what's your primary language? Mi lenguaje primario es inglés. Pero, que no la puedo hablar. Es que yo no sé porque en la escuela no aprendí about this is first of all his performance of researcher. Can you elaborate on that? And then his performance of high school freshman. That's good, mom, let's wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> very quickly cuts her off. So he speaks to her in English, asks her what her primary language is. She responds in Spanish and tells him her primary language is English. <laughs> and then goes on to explain to him systematically why she uses English and Spanish in strategic ways and with whom. So we might think, this is strange. If someone asks you what your primary language is, using the language that you identify as your primary language, you might expect that someone would respond to someone using that language that they've identified as their primary language. But that's simply not the linguistic norm in this household. In this household, he speaks English to his mom and she speaks Spanish back to him, even if she identifies English as her primary language. In fact, these language practices, these kind of asymmetrical bilingual practices, are a norm throughout the US and throughout the world in so many ways. What if our schools and, and our approaches to training teachers reflected these kinds of norms um, and, and such that the use of languages other than English weren't perceived as a problem? So what if these sorts of norms were how we approached language curricularly um, rather than trying to sort of see this as some sort of uh, deviant behavior? 
The students who were studying language in the linguistic landscape found that functional information like these welcome signs within the school were provided in English and Spanish. They found that privileged information associated with applying for college scholarships and applications was exclusively in English. And they found that punitive information like these no loitering signs that stood in front of the school were exclusively in Spanish and hyper non-standardized Spanish. So no angueo is a play off of the sort of non-standardized verb anguear, or no hanging out, no loitering. So the goal of this work was not simply to document inequality or document stigmatization, but rather to work with the community to speak back to this. So we worked with high school students within the school as part of a project we called Barante. We were working to implement an ethnic studies program within the school to train teachers and administrators to facilitate this ethnic studies program, to train social service providers to engage meaningfully with communities uh, moving away from deficit-based views and to, to work with the students to sort of transform what the linguistic landscape looks like. Again, the goal wasn't just to understand inequality, but to speak back to it and to transform this school and its community, which is part of a broader set of commitments that I've been working, uh, or broader set of projects and commitments that I've been developing with a range of communities in Chicago and elsewhere, uh, particularly an initiative that we're calling Community as a Campus, which involves a whole range of projects that are seeking to reposition communities not as these test sites or experiment sites for universities, but rather as profound spaces of knowledge production where people are theorizing and analyzing on an everyday basis in order to respond to their own reality. So really seeing communities not as places to be studied, but as spaces that are intellectual in their own right, where people are understanding and developing understandings of and responses to the forms of inequality that they're faced with. And I can talk about the different educational components of this um, if you're interested. So um, I wanted to just sort of um, conclude by saying that on one level, these issues surrounding Latinx identities and borders, of course, involve struggles over migration rights and struggles over citizenship, particularly questions around the ways in which inanimate objects and commodities have been endowed with more migration rights than human beings. So why is it that objects, uh, inanimate objects can cross borders but humans can't or have, can, can cross borders more readily? This notion, uh, these notions of illegality and really trying to challenge the, the histories out of which they emerge. Why is it that illegal has uh, been a, a, a term and a notion that's been mapped onto one's entire person in a particular way? But it's not simply about advocating for migration rights or citizenship um, sort of narrowly, but rather learning from other political struggles. Um, learning from a Black Lives Matter movement that seeks to call into question not just, or seeks to not just open up access to citizenship, but rather to transform citizenship, to recognize that various populations can be positioned as citizens formally and yet be excluded from the nation in all kinds of ways, or can be subject to all kinds of forms of discrimination. So what's it mean not simply to advocate for citizenship, but rather to transform citizenship so that there's no longer second, third, or fourth class citizenship? Perhaps, for example, if we wanted to broaden migration rights, we might think about why there is a supranational citizenship in the European Union, but there isn't any such thing as a citizenship of the Americas. Why is it that people can cross borders comfortably in other contexts, but not across the Americas? And you want to think about race, in particular, in relation to the US, Canada, and the rest of the Americas. Um, so, uh, this also involves learning from a whole range of other political struggles, especially efforts, decolonial efforts and indigenous efforts, um, thinking about, like the, the anti-Dakota Access Pipeline movement, to think about the ways that the colonial history of the United States should force us to reckon with the ways that we can't simply advocate for the United States as a nation of immigrants or Latinx populations as the nation's newest immigrants. We want to think about the ways that these narratives around immigration erase our nation's colonial history and indigenous history as well. So it's neither about championing access to citizenship, nor is it about championing um, immigration status in a narrow sense, but rather thinking with these various political struggles and learning with various political struggles to create a broader vision of collective change. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Sure, and this is to pass around to people. All right.